I didn't believe that they could help me. And it was about a week later. And in this week, I came within a hair of having BYU destroy my life. And I wouldn't be sitting here on any means if I'd have listened to what I was going to be told. And it was the following. Mr. Snar, this is Dr. Jex, ahead of the entire program. By the way, I liked him. He was very, very kind man. But he had that look about him that you know that he was highly educated and well informed on the subject. But he was informed on the subject of stuttering. I didn't care about that. I only cared about what the narrow but most important aspect was. What is involved in the process of overcoming the phenomenon or impediment of stuttering? That's all I cared about. Everything else was pure fluff. Redundant fluff. Joke. There's enough books written on the subject would fill this room that we're sitting in through history. Fluff. Mr. Snar. Science does not know why people stutter. What come, came to my mind? I care what the Lord says because science, they're out there having to experiment. The Lord only deals with truth. I didn't hear that. Science doesn't know why people stutter. Nobody knows why people stutter. There is no known cure for overcoming stuttering. I must be honest with you. You will stutter all the days of your life. Now, I don't want you to get upset about this. Don't get upset. Settle down. He could feel that I was all of a sudden just starting to that Annabelle snore, my mother, that was in me, which I'm so grateful I have a lot of that stuff in me. Or I'm not scared of anybody. That was in me. And it started to foam up inside me. And I think he could tell by my eyes and just by total being that I was, I was ready for war. And then he said, everybody has a problem. Yours happens to be stuttering. Some people have a wart on the end of their nose. Some people are a hair lip. Whatever it might be, some people are not quite as quick and as smart as others. Some people have a missing finger. Everyone has a problem. What we will do here in this program is to teach you how to live with your impediment so your impediment does not destroy you. And you know, in that moment, he just about had me. But he didn't have me. And I stood. And I screamed. Have you ever stuttered? He said, then you don't know how I feel or anyone else feels who stutters. And if it's the last thing I do on this earth, I will prove you wrong. And I was standing, I turned, and I walked to the door, and I walked out of that building. Before I got to the doorway that led me out of the building, one of the students ran after me. I'll never forget this. And he grabbed me by the arm, stopped me, said, please, stay. They really helped me. And if you will stay, they'll really help you. I can't remember what I said, if anything. 
probably one word no. But what I felt was they're all a bunch of losers and I'm not going to associate my life and put my life in the hands of losers. And when I left that building, that was indeed the worst day of my entire life. And the reason it was the worst day of my entire life, because I now knew and understood what it is to live without hope. Hope had vanished. And when one loses hope, despair sets in. And when despair sets in, people die. They might not fall dead where they're buried six feet under, but internally, they die. And I was on that edge, and that's what I meant by BYU came within the width of a hair in destroying my life. But it didn't, because in that same breath, I said, if it's the last thing I do on this earth, I will prove you wrong. So I had now established a goal. He says stuttering cannot be cured. He says I will always stutter. He says that basically I am finished. But BYU and having that thrown at me, this became the monumental transcendent tipping point of my entire life. I either go back and he is right, or somehow I go forward and I prevail. But in the moment, I had no clue to what was going to happen in the future. Well, time went on. I made it a point to be kind of the last kid that comes to the various classes. The first one to kind of leave, especially when we went to church, which I hated the idea of going because I might be asked to pray again. I didn't have to worry about David Yarn. He was on my side. And so therefore I'm really, let's say, I'm just a kind of a non-entity sitting there in the classroom. Well, I liked him. He died just uh, within the last uh, four years. I cut out his obituary out of the paper. It was amazing, his obituary. Now I'm wandering around the campus like a lost sheep. But yet, I had my roommates, and I, I joined a, 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 the Val Heyrich Social Unit that was very helpful for me. And the kids kind of rallied around me. I don't necessarily think I told the story to any of the social unit members because I didn't want people starting to feel sorry for me. I didn't want to be one of these guys running around, guess what, I am, I've been picked on, whatever it is. I mean, I had to be a man to stand in there. I mean, I've, after all, I've climbed through the ropes in a boxing match with someone I never knew anything about, and he's gonna come out and try and kill me, and I had to go after him, and I know what it's like to slug out things in life. And I know that's the reality of life, and I'm grateful for that. And that helped me to deal with the a position and the situation that I was in, which really was exceedingly uncomfortable. 